Hello everyone, welcome back to another edition of Garden Gnomes. We are doing our final spring report for our iNaturalist Naturing at Home project. I am Rachel Davis, horticulturist here at the Arboretum Public Garden, and here I have with me Lauren Glevenick. Want to introduce Lauren. yourself? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I am a recent graduate from UC Davis, graduated just this last week um, in plant biology, and I am a hor habitat horticulture intern, um, ready to show you what you saw <laughs> on my naturalist. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for contributing your observations this spring. I think it was such a really great opportunity to get outside, uh, take a break from being inside, <laughs> um, and really getting some of that nature RX while also contributing to some community science. So thank you all. I think we had almost 50 observers uh, and we'd love for you to continue on because we've realized like this is still a really great resource for our community. So for right now, we are continuing it through fall or until fall quarter begins and potentially maybe indefinitely, we'll see. So, uh, Today, we're going to kind of review all the uh, observations we've done, see how many species we've gotten. So um, we are going to be sharing a slideshow with you right now, and we are going to be transitioning to that. And Lauren's going to lead us through this report. All right. Um, so I guess, first of all, I just want to remind everybody that we've been using iNaturalist for this report. Uh, iNaturalist is, as Rachel said, a community science program. Uh, you download an app on your phone, take a picture of a wild animal, plant, fungus, bug, anything, um, and then upload it to iNaturalist where uh, other scientists and naturalists can come and review it, um, add an identification to it. And if enough people are able to identify it down to like exactly the species that it is, um, it can also be used in scientific research, like, you know, figuring out what the, like how the range is changing for a migratory bird. Like if you, if they have your data point, it could actually be a really cool um, part of scientific research. Uh, so we, we really like using iNaturalist for a couple of reasons. Number one, it does help research, um, but also it's like, it sort of allows you to document and like keep a list of things that you've actually seen in your backyard. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's sort of what our whole Naturing at Home project is about. Uh, it's through iNaturalist, but we're focusing on uh, wild life that you find in your own backyard. Uh, so this is our project report. Um, just a few quick stats about our project in particular. Um, as of a few days ago, um, we actually had almost 6,500 observations, which is phenomenal. That's so many data points. Um, and those observations covered over 1,000 different species. Uh, so as you can see, there's a breakdown here. The majority of them are plants in that green. Uh, we also have a lot of insects in the dark orange and the third largest group that we found were birds in blue. Um, and we do have a lot of other things too, like fish and mammals and fungi. And I guess it says like protozoans, which is really cool. I don't know. Um, <laughs> we found a lot of things in our project. So we want to get into a little bit um, more specific. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Uh, but one thing that I want to address before we go and look at all of our data uh, is some of the reasons why the data could be like incomplete or biased. Um, especially because this is community science and it's sourced through the community. Um, there's a lot of factors that can affect like how, how representative the data is of actually what's there. Like you can look at your yard and you can only choose to document like one or two insects that you find. And while that's still really, really helpful for science, you didn't document your whole yard. You don't need to, um, but it's just a little subset of what you find. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, for community science biases, the first thing that I have here is visibility and accessibility. Mm -hmm. um, so visibility uh, refers to like how easily can you see what's in your yard. It's sort of like there's a lizard on top of a rock sunning or in its underground burrow. Like you're going to see one of them and not the other one. Um, and along with that is accessibility, like how well can you like get up close to something to take a photo of it? Um, like, first of all, can you see it? And then if you get close to take a photo, will it run away? Um, mm -hmm. So that, that can be a little tricky if you wanted to document something but can't. Um, 
that's, and that's also, why go ahead and that's why we're <laughs> always like be sneaky sneakiness is key <laughs> yeah <laughs> the the one like oh every tip was be sneaky and it's true <laughs> But this can also be affected by the time of day. Um, like if you're going out in the morning, you'll probably see more birds. But if you're looking for birds in the evening, it, you probably won't see them. So that's visibility. Um, animal habits, I was gonna, that's like flying away or running away. Um, yeah, you won't be able to access them. Um, but one other bias that is actually really present in our current project is this individual preference. Um, some people really like taking photos of plants. That's fine. Some people actually exclusively take photos of birds. Birders. That's, that's okay. <laughs> if you're a birder, that's fine. I like plants better, but that's fine. <laughs> but individual preference, especially if you're providing a lot of observations, uploading a lot of data points, it can kind of skew the data toward birds if we have a lot of birders. Um, but we'll see a couple things like that in a minute. Uh, and then the last thing I have here is charismatic species. Um, and that's why I have these two photos on the slides as well. Charismatic species are often the more big, beautiful ones that everyone loves, like the swallowtail butterfly. Uh, they're really easy to see. We love having them in the garden. Uh, they're actually pretty easy to photograph because they like stay still for a minute to drink the nectar. Um, so we, sent, we tend to have more observations of the big, beautiful species that people love uh, and fewer of things like ants, um, <laughs> which is the other photo. Uh, just because they're smaller, they're harder to photograph. It's hard to get good resolution with a phone camera. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they're smaller. People don't love them. They even consider them, like, you know, pests. pests. Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes they are a little pesty, but they do have their place, especially if they're native. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, in this one, um, the ant that I chose to put on the slide is on a rose petal. Um, mm -hmm. So it might be like a little a honey ant. Like they just they 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 they, they like the nectar too. Like let <laughs> them have fun. They're there for the same purpose as the butterfly. Uh, well, maybe not exactly. They don't pollinate. Well, they could. Anyways, <laughs> um, I just wanted to address some of these biases before we actually start looking at our data. Uh, just so you know that this isn't like a complete picture of everything that everyone has seen in their their backyard. Um, but it is really neat to see what people have documented. So. Um, as a reminder, I know this is all before we get to the data, but as a reminder, um, we looked at our data on the wild to urban scale, uh, which is just a tell of how dense the development is around that area. Uh, so as you can see, wildlands has almost no human activity at all, like visible in the landscape, only a couple of trails. Um, but as you go toward the urban area, you start to get more like roads and occasional buildings in the rural areas. Um, and then once we get to suburban, residential, and urban, you can see that the density of buildings and the coverage of asphalt is much higher. Uh, so we were mostly focusing on observations that we found in suburban, residential, and urban areas, just to see what insects will actually make it into concrete jungle. Um, but we also included, um, wild and rural areas in our study as well, just to sort of give a comparison of what we found in the different areas. Uh, so if you would like your data to be used for this and you're on iNaturalist, you're contributing to the project, um, make sure you fill out the observation field, wild to urban, and put one of these uh, on there. We have a little tutorial in our previous video as well. Um, but that's important to remember. Uh, but with that, <laughs> anything else to add, Rachel, before we go into the data? Nope, that's great. All right, so this is what we found. <laughs> so that. the overall distribution of all of the bar graphs shows how many observations we found in each one. So we found under 500 observations for the wild areas, more than 1500 in rural areas and so on. Um, we did find a lot in the rural areas and there's a couple of reasons for this. Mm -hmm. uh, number one, it was skewed by the top observers in our project. Um, we have a couple people, sorry, that's me. Including um, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> I know that um, add a lot of observations um, and a lot of those come from rural areas because those rural areas are places where it's really easy to hike while socially distancing. Um, 
So I know I tend to go to Puda Creek Riparian Reserve, which I consider rural, um, and Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area. That's where a lot of the other uh, rural observations come from. Um, but these are places where, you know, you can go look for wildlife. It's a more of a destination. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you are choosing to go outside and go hiking, rural areas are, are really popular. Absolutely. Cool. Um, and then we've also seen down here the suburban, residential, and urban. Um, I do want to point out a couple of things that we see, like differences between like this side of the graph, the suburban to urban, um, versus the wild and rural. Um, if you look at the, the chunks, like the distribution of what we actually saw within these, um, in the suburban and the residential areas, the largest chunk is the yellow, which is insects. Uh, so we actually found more bugs than you know, plants or birds or anything else combined. Um, so that was really interesting, actually, because when you look at what people actually saw, like go into the photo observations of what they uploaded, um, you'll see a lot of backyard insects. It's, mm -hmm. it's really happy. It's like bees and ladybugs and butterflies and katydids and really cool things um, that show that people are really like looking for the backyard wildlife that they have. So yeah. that made me really happy. Um, Great biodiversity in our backyards for sure. Exactly. Uh, one other thing that I really liked about this residential um, distribution is you can see that the top bar is that light teal color. Uh, which corresponds on our graph to other and you're like what else is there <laughs> <laughs> but that's like arachnids and so spiders and um what else is in there like fish and mollusks and amphibians you know, yes amphibians um so because there's a, such a big bar in that residential area for the other group that also shows like if you could if we broke it down by the individual groups it would be such thin lines that you couldn't see it because compared to insects there weren't that many but that shows that we had a huge amount of biodiversity in these residential areas which i don't know it makes me really happy <laughs> uh, but we will get to actually see some of these things that people found in a minute i picked out some highlights yeah. um, but this is super great Definitely keep observing things in suburbal, sub suburbal, suburban, <laughs> residential, and urban areas. Um, we really want to build up like the observations that we see in these areas because I feel like those are the most interesting, uh, and they tell us a lot about you know how to create better habitat for the wild animals that use your backyard. Um, right. Anything else, Rachel? Yeah, uh, you kind of pointed this out a little bit, but because of the, the yellow sections, uh, rural, suburban, and residential, like such huge chunks, but it's just really cool to see that we have that much diversity, or at least individuals, because this is individuals, correct? Not species. Yes. Yeah. Just that we have that many available. And we, you and I discussed like the plant um, numbers. And I think that is just because there are more wild plants in the wild and rural versus the suburban, residential, and urban. And it's still cool that we're able to get some of these plants, even though they're cultivated, uh, especially if you captured different insects on those plants too, because some of you did both the insect or whatever's on it and the plant. So uh, I think that's super interesting to see as well. So. Like a lot of the plants in the residential, urban, and suburban areas, um, those plants were what we call captive or cultivated, in this case, cultivated. Um, but that's a way that you mark on iNaturalist uh, that it's a garden plant. It's not wildly wild occurring. You planted it there. Um, and that's still like, th we love those observations because it tells us what's in the area for other insects to come and use. Um, yeah, but I think that's why like the plant count in the rural and wild areas was a little higher because, mm -hmm. you know, there are more weedy species and, you know, I mean, you can have a bunch of weedy species in a single area uh, and, you know, different trees. And, you know, with plants in suburban areas, it's like you pretty much like know what you have in your garden um, or intentionally plant them there. So it can yeah. be fewer, but super Great. cool. Ready to move on? Yeah. All right, so I did want to highlight some of the observations that people found in suburban and residential areas. Uh, 
this is your backyard biodiversity. Uh, so we saw that the top groups were insects and birds and I mean, plants were after that, but I thought this amphibian was really cool. Um, so <laughs> we have this one. You can definitely see that this quail is sitting on a rooftop, definitely in a residential um, suburban area. And, you know, it's just really, it's always really cool to see quail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I really like their little feathers on the top of their head. State bird, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, sometimes it's a little hard to see them. Like whenever I go hiking, I always hear them and I never see them. I'm like, oh, where are they? They're also in your backyard. So you don't mm -hmm. even have to go out to look for them. Um, exactly. And then I did, Rachel, I picked your, your Western toad because yes. I love this picture. Um, <sighs> Well, well, that was something found in the backyard. Yeah, actually, he or she, <laughs> I don't know my toads very well, uh, was actually in my pool. I was out to go on a really hot day to go in my pool, and it was like swimming in there. So we had this wine barrel with a little driftwood in it. So I was like, maybe you'll be happier here. Plus, I don't want to swim with you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like you, you got to be there at the right place, the right time yes. um, in order to capture that, that observation at all. So, I mean, it just shows like looking at different times of day, like unexpected places uh, that also might get you some cool observations. Exactly. I love that photo. Um, and then the last <laughs> one that I chose uh, is a carpenter bee um, visiting a, I think that's a salvia. Uh, correct, Rachel? My plant identification tell. skills. <laughs> the, the, flower, the flower looks correct. The seeds look correct. The mint only, <laughs> yes, salvia probably. <laughs> um, but that one's a really cool one. Um, I mean, people have seen so many different kinds of bees in their backyard. Like if you look at a breakdown of bees exclusively, it's incredible. Like you have the typical Western honeybee, you have a bunch of different native bees, and then you have these big ones. I love these ones. <laughs> um, this one actually, I think is nectar Carpenter. robbing. It's yeah. like sticking sticking its tongue through the pet the flower to bypass. It's, it's not going the correct way. It's like cheating to get the nectar through the top of the flower. Yeah. Um, that's a pretty cool interaction, I thought. Um, it is. <laughs> but we've seen a lot of insects, birds, uh, plants, and even amphibians in backyards. So I wanted to highlight those. Um, and then going off of insects, um, one really cool thing that you can do with iNaturalist data is sort of uh, we have enough data points that we can make comparisons between like urban environments and wild environments. So I decided to look at insects. Um, I tried looking at pollinators, but there's a lot of different insects in there and not all of them are pollinators. So we'll look at this. Um, but the things that we found most often in urban environments, number one was pretty expected. It was the Western honeybee. Uh, this is the typical bee, you see it everywhere. Um, but it's sort of interesting to see what we would like the runners up to the top spot. Um, like what else is pretty common that people have seen a lot of? Uh, turns out to be bumblebees, um, a few ty types of uh, butterflies, including the mournful deskewing and the painted lady. And then also our favorite, the ladybug. Um, but those are the top ones in urban environments. Yeah. I think I have some highlights that I found here. Of like, these are examples of, you know, in urban environments, where what have people seen uh, i believe that this um the ladybug on the left is from the arboretum to like the wildflower meadow it's um a concrete dominated landscape um, by scrubs cafe and next to the teaching nursery actually uh, there's a lot of parking lots big buildings it's right next to the veteran medicine school um but it's in like this concrete environment and then there's a little flower bed uh little it's medium. <laughs> Come on. Um, so that was a really cool place in urban environments. And then on the right is this bee fly. It's actually a fly, not a bee, but it mm -hmm. looks like a bee to trick people. Um, I actually found this one right in front of this graduate school of management. Like it's right in the, it's on campus. It's, you know, again, concrete dominated. Um, and it's on this landscaping plant. Uh, but you know, it's just, it's really cool to see such a wild insect there. So yeah, that's sort of what we're talking about when we're looking at urban insects. And anyways, okay, here we go. So I decided to look at urban, residential, and suburban insects. I mean, these are residential and suburban. And again, we see sort of the same trend where we see a lot of the Western honeybee. 
a lot, you can sort of even match them up on the screen, like the Western mm -hmm. honeybees, um, the yellow-faced bumblebees, ladybugs, although they're different species, we see them, um, they're, sort of, they're in the same sort of group of insects. Um, we also see like the larger horsefly, like carpenter bee, it's a really specific like, subspecies of um, a, a, car a carpenter bee. We also see the painted lady down here. Uh, if you're wondering what the nomad bees are, um, that's from observations taken in Oregon. Uh, yeah. So we're, our project is open all across the United States. Uh, so it's just kind of interesting that, you know, we had so many observations in, in like Portland, Oregon, uh, that the nomad bees actually made it onto the top list. Yay. So there we go. Um, it is biodiversity just in a different area. Uh, so if you're in Davis, um, I guess y you can look for them, but I, I wouldn't guarantee any. <laughs> but I wanted to look at what, like, why do we see so many of these, like, typical insects in urban, residential, suburban, and pretty much are they different than what we find in wild areas? So then I sorted everything by like things found in wild areas. And you can see that we actually have somewhat similar, but a much more diverse group of insects. So once again, top, top insect is Western honeybee, of course. Mm -hmm. um, we also have in this group um, on, the, on the far right on the top row is our seven spotted lady beetle. So we also have the lady beetle. And then just below the honeybee, we also have the bumblebee. So those are our top three players in the more urban side. But then we also have a bunch of insects that we haven't seen before, like the dancers, um, new kinds of butterflies, like this, the checker spot and below it, the skipper. Um, we also have those bee flies, like we saw in, in that photo previously. Grasshoppers, moths, another kind of butterfly. Um, but we see a much more like biodiverse sort of collection of these in wild areas as compa compared to urban areas. Um, and I think it's really interesting to look at this because, uh, you know, these insects in exist in wild areas, you know, around Davis, around California, around the country, actually, because we have observations all around there. Um, but it just shows like this is what's available to us. Like this is what yeah. lives already in wild areas. Um, and if we make better habitat corridors uh, by, you know, planting native species, I mean, you can choose a native species that's also beautiful and functional in your garden. Um, and these insects, like they know the species that they need that grows in the that grow in the wild. So by create by planting, you know, a habitat for them in your yard and extending the range of their the wild plants that they need to live. You can actually invite some of these really pretty and unique wild insects into your backyard by creating those habitat corridors. Absolutely. And that is a goal of our habitat horticulture team. <laughs> yeah, not to preach uh, too much. <laughs> um, but we, I, I love studying like the insect biodiversity and you know how plants can, can affect that. Um, it was actually really, really neat to see that a lot of the insects that we, if you go in and look at the individual observations, a lot of the insects that we found in the urban and urban side of the scale, um, those were mostly found on, you know, cultivated garden plants. Mm -hmm. But if you look at them, a lot of them are like, known to be really good species for supporting bees, butterflies, pollinators. Um, you know, even if we go back to these these two like those gold fields uh there's a study that came out from uc davis from the neil williams lab that mm -hmm. you know reported the best or not the best wildflowers but the wildflowers that supported the greatest diversity of native insects yes. and gold fields was one of them uh, mm -hmm. so that's why the arboretum has you know we're starting to sell seed packets that are you know gold fields and lupins and those wildflowers that you know do support a lot of insects um, and so can function as living mulch as well as green mulch in your garden. Because mm -hmm. they're seasonal, <laughs> they're annual. Yes. Um, wow, way to promote this, Rachel. <laughs> I know, we gotta plug it. Yeah, but um, since they're annual, they'll like, they support the, you know, you don't see native bees, you know, you see the most of them in summer, and that's when like a lot of these wildflowers are actively blooming. Um, 
do you like support the seasonality of those insects as well? I don't know. Right. It's really cool. Um, but then even with this bee fly, yeah. um, this plant is known. It's planted in our uh, pollinator. I don't know. Not, not in the pollinator triangle, but in the pollinator garden. Uh, the habitat gardens. It. The habitat yeah. gardens. Yeah. Because um, it's known to be a good nectar source for bees. Um, Absolutely. Anyways, we've seen a lot of like really good plants in urban areas. So uh, along with these wild insects, we encourage you to plant. If you're planning on you know changing up your garden a little bit, planting those native species to create that habitat for these really cool bugs. Anyways, now I want to move on to some highlights of like actual observations that have been posted to our project, uh, starting with some insects. Uh, I chose these three in particular because number one, they're really good photos. Cool. Uh, good job, number, everyone. <laughs> yes, they're, things are beautiful. Um, I wasn't expecting that, honestly, because you know most of iNaturalist is like, you just post, um, an image that you hope other people can use for research. Like, it doesn't have to be this beautiful. Uh, it can be kind of blurry, They're not, not gonna lie, it's fine. Um, I post plenty of blurry photos uh, just to get the identification, get the mm -hmm. data point. Um, exactly. But these were especially beautiful, I thought. <clears throat> um, I wanted to point out the two bee species. Um, these are not honeybees, so they are, they're totally different. The one on the left is a U European wool carter bee, um, and the one on the right is a black-tailed bumblebee. So, I mean, they're both like black and yellow stripes, the typical bee, but they're different kinds, which I thought was really cool. Yep. Uh, and both of them are visiting typical garden plants, like captive cultivated garden plants. Um, so that's another indicator that you can, you know, plant really pretty, beautiful plants that are also functional in a, attracting these, the diversity of bees to your garden as well. Yeah. And then the one in the middle, I just thought he was really cool. It's like a toothbrush caterpillar. <laughs> <laughs> this one was found in a suburban area. It's right next to a residential area next to like a little a tiny belt of green space. Um, and it, I think it's on a pepper tree judging by the leaves, so. um, but I don't know. It's just, it's a beautiful find. It's super, super cool. I love when you go outside and it's like, I totally wasn't expecting to see that today. And exactly. There it is. Mm -hmm. um, here you go. Cool. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another um, sort of really cool thing that we saw was a lot of people posting, um, yeah, predator and prey interactions. Mm -hmm. um, if you get a shot like this, you can also post the same picture twice um, to mm -hmm. identify both sides of the interaction. Mm -hmm. um, Rachel, actually, that spider is your observation. It is a bold jumping spider with a nice juicy earwig. I love it. <laughs> and this I just captured right after my volunteers were talking about, like, how do I get rid of my earwigs? Like, who eats them? And I'm like, well, the bold jumping spider does. <laughs> That is a juicy oh. earwig also. <laughs> and and this one was definitely in a super urban area. This is at the Terrace Garden over by Davis Commons. So it's like the freeway's right there, the railroad's right there, but we had a nice enough uh, concentration of a teeny garden that it's good habitat. I love that you can you can see like the bright, like iridescent chompers. I don't know the actual Calissery, name. <laughs> Calissery. Yeah. Entomologist. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, arachnids. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> also, look, look, look at the eyes. The eyes are cute. I don't know. They that's are. A, it's a cute spider. Apparently, you know there's gonna, a character you know called Lucas bite the you. spider. Sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That's okay. Uh, you know he's not going to bite you because he was already eating something. Anyway. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then the other one that I chose to highlight. Um, was this California vole, unfortunately, mm -hmm. in the claws of an American kestrel. Um, I love it. This was taken by one of our observers in the Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area. Um, lots of like open fields. It's like it's a drainage field for excess water and things, but they were, it's, I don't know. Uh, it's a wildlife area. Uh, so, you know, they, they, it supports a lot of these little like mouse like, like mice and rats and voles and snakes and things like mm -hmm. that. Uh, which are delicious snacks for birds of prey like this. Yes. Um, so I, this was just a really cool shot, I thought. The and circle of life. The <laughs> dotted circle of life. The circle of life. <laughs> <laughs> and 
uh, one last highlight slide, Yay! and it's for baby animals because we saw because this project ran through spring, we got to see mm -hmm. a lot of really cute baby animals. Yes. Um, starting in the, the very, very top, uh, right? Mm -hmm. Those are baby rats. <laughs> that was uh, found by one of the interns uh, or the co-coordinators of our Habitat Horticulture team. Um, if you're doing some yard work and you're digging up a space <laughs> for a new garden bed, look, look out <laughs> because yep. you might find something. Um, Oh, they're actually really cute, even though they're, they're really cute. I know. That's fine. Um, <laughs> but then, like, the rest of these are birds just because that's a lot of, like, what we saw. Uh, but in the spring, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the bottom left is a family. There's another uh, adult goose out of the picture. But it's a family of Canada geese in the Poudre Creek Riparian Reserve, uh, just south of campus. Um, all those little goslings, they're just swimming along. I love them. Um, and then in the, the center picture uh, was also taken in Poudre Creek Riparian Reserve, uh, and that is a juvenile downy woodpecker. Um, I took that photo, it was incredible. Uh, my observation, like if you see the other photos in it, um, I like had to zoom into the hole in the wood and you can see the baby poking his head out. <laughs> but the downy woodpecker, um, they live in the holes in trees. They don't even like the nest boxes that are down there. Mm. Um, but I was walking, you know, just just walking through the, the reserve, looking for birds, looking for cool interactions. Um, and I heard this bird call and I could not figure out where it was coming from because there's there was like no movement in the trees above me. It was really loud. There is like open space beyond this one tree. And I'm like, okay, where is this coming from? And so I'm, I'm like trying my best to like echo locate. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like standing right next to this branch. And I'm like, I, I don't understand what's, what's here. Um, and I actually had to like sit down, like kneel down on the ground and look up um, because the hole where it was like poking out, uh, it was facing the ground. So I had to like kneel down and like angle my camera up uh, and wait. I had to sit very, very quietly and wait for this bird to like poke his little head out to see if I was still there. Nice. Um, this one was taken from a little farther away. Like I, he wasn't coming out. So I got up and I left and then he stuck his head out and was yelling for like worms or something. <laughs> um, that's like my favorite observation of the entire, of the entire project. Um, but then we have one last, oh, go ahead, Rachel. Just one last note that as we're starting to wrap up, if you have any questions, go ahead and post them in the chat and we can have a little bit of time for that if anyone has any. Okay, keep going. Good. Uh, the last baby animal that I have is a wild turkey, but a baby. Yeah. <gasps> uh, <laughs> I love this photo so much. Um, but this one was taken in Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area. Uh, there were a couple baby turkeys roosting in this tree, but this was a really clear shot of one of them. Um, you can sort of see like in the beak shape and the eye size and shape, like, oh, that's so beautiful. So um, cute. Yeah. Uh, but one thing that I also wanted to point out um, about, you know, looking at these geese, um, we also saw a lot of baby duck uh, photos in our project as well, both wood ducks and mallards in the Arboretum waterway. Um, and one thing that I wanted to point out about that is that even though they are very cute, uh, we don't want to be feeding ducks, especially if they're in the Arboretum. Um, I know that's really fun, but it's actually horrible for the duck's health. Um, number one, feeding them like breadcrumbs and things can make them sick. It's not like what they are naturally that's supposed to eat. Uh, number two, it can sort of like clog up the Arboretum waterway and like make it super nasty and not a great habitat for them to live in. Uh, and third, they like ducks are there, like they're there because the waterway can support them naturally. Uh, so this is it comes back to like all the eco ecological interactions, but they naturally eat like those aquatic plants, bugs, things that they find you know, naturally in the arboretum. Um, and if we supplement that with extra food by feeding them. Um, it, it's really damage. It damages their health because, mm -hmm. like, if that food source suddenly goes away, like you stop coming for a weekend or something, uh, it's it's an unreliable food source, and it might cause like the population to die back. That's really sad, and 
you don't want to see that. And but it's like, yeah, you 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 don't we want to let them uh, live in an environment that can support them. Um, so that's why we kind of want to leave them alone. Yes, definitely. That was just personal PSA. <laughs> <laughs> well, for the Arboretum as well. We want to make sure that our, everything in our entire system is, is as healthy as they can be. Yeah. Beautiful. Great. Uh, so sort of to wrap up um, our whole iNaturalist project, um, we originally planned it to run only for spring quarter, but we've extended the we've extended the debt the like range of the project to run through the end of summer mm -hmm. um, with potential to be extended into fall quarter as well so that means you still have time to join our iNaturalist program um, you can still add observations things like that uh, but we do want to challenge everybody to expand your observations uh, to a group that you don't typically document um, like if you've only been looking at the plants in your garden with the weedy species uh, maybe try looking for some bugs like sit and wait at a cluster of flowers for some pollinators. Um, maybe try to take a photo of that bird that you always see, but don't know what it is. Um, yeah. Even blurry photos, like people can, there's like, it's amazing what people can like identify with. Like you could see the silhouette of a bird and somebody will know what it is. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't have to be a fantastic photo. Um, and I picked these two photos for this point exactly. Uh, because these were both taken on a cell phone, like no fancy camera, no lenses, anything. Uh, the one on the left is a calligrapher fly. Um, it's a hoverfly. It was, this was found in the Arboretum as well. Um, it's super zoomed in because you know you don't wanna scare off the, bee, the, the flies or anything. Um, but even if it's a little bit pixelated, it, this one still got to research grade, which means enough people were able to come in and verify like what species it is that it can be used as a research data point. Exactly. Um, so it doesn't have to be a beautiful, beautiful photo. It can be functional like this as well. Um, it doesn't mean it's not beautiful. I like those ones. <laughs> <laughs> and then the one on the left is another photo taken with a cell phone. Um, like my mom texts me photos of things that she finds in the garden all the time. I'm like, just put it on an astralis, but <laughs> I do it for her. Um, but these are just little, like interesting little fungi. You're going out into your garden, like, oh, what projects do I have to do today? And then it's like, oh my gosh, I have never seen that before. Mm -hmm. Might as well document it. Like, I have no idea what that is. Do you know? I don't know. Um, some well, sort of little mushroom. <laughs> and that's why we have this huge community on iNaturalist that can help us. Like, that's part of the point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's one of our challenges to you is uh, try going after a group that you haven't even tried yet. Uh, mm -hmm. You probably would be very surprised with what you can find and, you know, what you can actually, like, contribute to the community science. Exactly. All right. Uh, this is our last uh, wrap-up slide, but these are just the take-homes that we want everybody to know about our project. Um, definitely keep observing. We've extended it through, through the end of summer for now. Um, so we're really interested in seeing how the composition of animals that we find changes. Like we have springtime animals, but mm -hmm. then we also have like migratory animals that are coming up like through, through summer. Um, we're going to get a whole new batch of insects, like more native bees, more dragonflies. Butterflies. Um, yeah. Butterflies. Yeah, for sure. Um, so as it warms up, definitely keep observing because we want to track like how, how nature changes throughout this time of uh, the spring to summer. Um, and also keep building the community of naturalists, uh, keep getting people to come join our project and contribute observations. Uh, it's always better if we have more people and more areas. Um, it makes our data a little bit more robust. Um, yes. Definitely. Uh, just from a stats perspective, it makes the data more robust. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, but also uh, challenge yourself to document that, bi that backyard biodiversity, like we said in the previous slide, doesn't have to be a great picture. This needs to be functional. Um, and then also, if you want uh, your data to be included in our future um, like data analyses like this, uh, remember to add observation fields. Um, you in, in the observation field part, you find wild to urban. And there's mm -hmm. a drop down list of what area you're in. Uh, if you need a tutorial on that, we did that in our previous video as well. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely remember to add those so that your data is used for our purposes as well. Yeah. So. 
And you can find links to those old videos uh, in the link that is scrolling at the bottom here. So go ahead and check that out if you'd like to catch up with us, especially uh, you can send new uh, naturalists to that page as well, just to get another introduction. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for putting this slideshow together to give us a report of spring, Lauren. Do you have any final thoughts um, on that? Um, I guess my final thought is I personally went through and uh, ver and like reviewed 3,500 of these observations um, <laughs> and added the observation fields to them. It took me about two weeks. So I would just really like to stress that if you would like your data used, add the observation <laughs> fields. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm just, I'm really, really proud of how this project has, has gone this spring quarter. Like we have nearly 50 observers. Like that's, that's a lot of engagement for our Arboretum community. Um, thank you again, everybody for continually adding observations. Um, yes. It's just fascinating to see what everybody sees, you know, while, while we're all at home. Um, and it's a, it's a great way to like, you know, again, tying into that nature RX, it's a great way to de-stress is to just go sit in your garden for an hour and figure out like what else lives here with me. Absolutely. It could be a little unsettling if it's spiders, but that's <laughs> But they're so cool. They're hopping with the other insects you don't want. <laughs> yes. Sometimes. Thank you, Lauren, so much for working so hard on this project and bringing your expertise as a naturalist. It has been so fun to work with you and really get our community engaged. So thank you so much. Um, Thank you all for tuning in. A couple reminders, next week is National Pollinator Week. So super excited to put some posts up about local pollinators. We're also gonna have the Habitat Horticulture team read some really fun read aloud children's books. Uh, we have Bees Are the Best, uh, uh, If Hummingbirds Could Hum, and Senorita Mariposa, which is a bilingual children's book. So we'll have those posted next week. Uh, join in. Uh, I'll also be back here next Thursday at 10 a.m. to talk a little bit more about pollinator gardening, how you can do that at home, some tried and true plants, but also some new ones that we'd love you to consider. So um, tune back in next week. Uh, follow us on all the different social medias to be updated. And uh, we hope you have a great rest of the week. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs>